Okay, let's get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about bipedal locomotion today, a wonderful way to get from point A to point B, except when you're moving over icy surfaces. Hopefully nobody fell this morning. Two legs are great, but when one leg goes out from under you, you've only got one left to recover with. Pros and cons. Okay. We'll talk about bipedal locomotion today. We will finish that uh, discussion, and then we will move on to the third theme of the course, which are open challenges, open problems uh, in the field. There are major challenges to scale up evolutionary robotics. Uh, deep learning in just the last few years, thanks to some algorithmic innovations and a big data revolution, neural networks. So people have figured out finally how to get neural networks to work on very big uh, and complex problems. Robotics has not made that leap yet. Some of you might go and work in the robotics industry and figure out how to scale up robotics or perhaps evolutionary robotics. So we'll look in this section on challenges about some of the stumbling blocks or some of the obstacles that are keeping us from scaling up some of these approaches to very large and complex uh, problems. Okay, before we do, let's carry on with bipedal locomotion. Any questions about the assignments, final project? All good? Okay, so um, just to recall, when we're talking about bipedal locomotion or any form of locomotion, we're always trying to strike, or different modes of locomotion strike a different balance between four competing objectives. What are they? Efficiency. Efficiency, energy efficiency. We're going to look at that particularly as it relates to bipedal locomotion today. Stability. Stability. So we've got energy efficiency, stability. Versatility. Uh, versatility or robustness, how many environments can you move through given your particular mode of locomotion? And the fourth one is speed, speed right? Okay. So we ended last time by looking at two different robots that strike very different extreme balances between these four objectives. We looked at the Asimo robot, which moves pretty quickly and is relatively versatile, or at least it was at the time that it was built, which was back in the 2000s. However, Asimo had one fatal flaw, or one big drawback. What was it? It wasn't making use of the pendulum motion of legs. It wasn't making use of the pendulum motion of your vertically aligned legs, right? So Asimo is actuating or moving all, applying force to its motors at all times, which give, gives it its particular silly walk. And that big battery you see on its back is necessary. We ended last time by looking at the passive dynamic walker. This was one of the first passive dynamic walkers, which strikes a balance in the opposite direction. It is just about as energy efficient as you can be. No motors, no sensors, no battery, no electronics. Arguably not even a robot at all, just a mechanical mechanism. But obviously this comes at a cost. What's the cost? It's always a cost. It's not robust. It's not robust. This passive dynamic walker walks down this plank. Uh, this was worked on at Cornell. I was there about 15 years ago and I uh, was in the lab next door and you'd go over and there are big signs that says, do not touch the declined plane. If you were to alter that plane by a fraction of a degree, the passive dynamic walker would not work at all. So it was minimally robust. The ecological niche in which the passive dynamic Passive dynamic walker works, it's very, very narrow. We exhibit pass some passive dynamics, but obviously we can walk down more than declined planes. Again, ice not so easily, but most, most relatively flat environments we can get over just fine. So today we're gonna start at this extreme end and ask, can we start with the purely mechanical mechanism of the passive dynamic walker? and slowly start to add on motors and sensors and electronics and neural network controllers and all the rest. Not unlike what we saw when we were looking at the minimal cognition experiments. We're gonna start at this minimal end of things with locomotion and gradually move up to, gradually move up to what's known as hybrid dynamic locomotion. So what we really do when we're walking is part of the time, or during part of the gait cycle, your swing foot 
the one that's not in contact with the ground, all the muscles in that leg are all relaxed and it's acting as a pendulum, but obviously your other leg, the stance foot and the stance leg, the muscles are tensed. You have to keep yourself upright as you move forward. So if you think about the gait cycle of bipedal locomotion, at any one time one of the legs is relaxed and the other one is not. There are different ways you can do this. At the Technical University of Delta in the Netherlands, they built uh, this hybrid dynamic walker. It's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look very carefully, when the heel, uh, the back foot leaves the ground, at that precise instance, there is a motor in the hip here. There's a series of motors in the hip that give a very brief impulse. They give a brief pulse of force, which starts pushing or accelerating the leg forward. And most of the time, this robot is using passive dynamic walker, uh, passive dynamic walking, but every once in a while, there is a little bit of force. And the empty bucket on the head is to remind us that there's not a lot of complexity here. It's a little bit, the robot has to sense when to give this impulse force, but the rest of the time, physics takes care of everything else, right? So again, this is an extremely an extreme example of exploiting the interaction between the body and the environment. One of the, the poster children for this idea of embodied cognition. If you get the body right, you get the right tool to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back, you can get away with very, very little control, like the robot that you see here. Okay, both robots, however, the passive dynamic walker and the hybrid dynamic walker, these machines are extremely difficult to build. You gotta get everything just right. The curvature on the underside of the feet of the passive dynamic walker, and the same thing for the hybrid dynamic walker here, that curvature is very, very specific. Uh, as you could see in the case of the hybrid dynamic walker, it walks, but it's not very stable. If there's a little bit of a bump in the ground or something else is slightly off, uh, the hybrid dynamic walker is in trouble. So a lot of manual, uh, a lot of robotics, a lot of engineering expertise went into this. What we're going to look at today, what we're going to look at today is, as you can probably imagine, an evolutionary approach to this. Can we get evolution to not only evolve the controller for these machines, but also the body? So this is the first experiment you're going to see in this course where we're going to expand the evolutionary algorithm. So now it has control not, o not just over the synaptic weights in the neural network controller, but also over the body. Sorry, I misspoke. You've probably already seen a few. Of, Sam already showed you some of his evolving morphology robots. Second time you're going to see that in this course. Okay, so what's the idea here? Well, we're going to start by asking the question, first of all, can we evolve passive dynamic walking, and if so, how? In that case, obviously, there's no brain at all. There's just the mechanism, so evolution only has the body to play with. And as you can imagine, the answer to this is yes, and we'll see how in a moment. Once we're able to evolve passive dynamic walking, can we then continue evolution and change the ecological niche of the robot where we gradually decrease the declined plane? It's a little bit difficult to see here, but in the passive dynamic case, you can see the robot walking down the, the declined plane, and then we're gradually going to remove the declined plane until we have a robot that's walking on flat ground. And as we're gradually removing the declined plane, we're going to gradually bring in a little bit of control, and evolution is going to expand and start to tinker not just with the body, but with the neural controller as well. What is this process called, where we're gradually removing this decline plane and challenging the robot? Scaffolding. This is yet another example of scaffolding, right? We're removing the training wheels from the bicycle. Okay, so we'll look at phase one uh, first and then, then phase two. Okay, as you saw in the picture here, we're gonna look at this particular bipedal robot. How are they gonna go about evolving the morphology? Well, one of the most important things in passive dynamic walking is getting the mass distribution right. As we talked about last time, if your weight is too far forward and your center of mass is in front of your polygon of support, you fall forward. If your center of mass is too far back, behind your polygon of support, you fall backwards. 
In this case, we're going to start with a machine that cannot sense its center of mass, cannot sense anything else, because it has no sensors and motors. So we're going to have to get that mass distribution just right. To do that, uh, the investigators placed these lead weights, or these pieces of mass, on the two thighs, the two shanks, and in this picture is not shown. There's a fifth mass that's hung right from the, the hip. So these five blocks, and evolution is going to play around with where these blocks are placed which slightly changes the mass distribution of the robot. As you can see in the right-hand panel here, uh, we've got two rotational uh, hinges at the hip. Again, not unlike us, so we can rotate our leg inward and outward and forward and back. One at the knee and two at the ankle. So one at the ankle that allows us to rotate our foot forward and up and left and right. right? So five joints on one side, five on the other, a total of 10 joints, and eventually we're going to have 10 motors, but not yet, just joints. Okay. Let's look at this in a little more detail. They specified, as you can see here, a series of 12 uh, parameters. The first uh, three here specify the, uh, the mass itself, how big, how heavy is that mass. Uh, there's a fourth one down here on the foot. Uh, the actual length of the legs uh, themselves are going to be evolved by evolution. The X and Ys are the X and Y offset of, these, uh, of the mass. So how far in towards the center of the robot or how far outwards uh, are they? The length of the foot itself, the radius of the hip, how broad uh, is the hip? And then finally, B sub Y, which is the starting hip angle about the Y axis. If you go back and watch the passive dynamic walking video at your leisure, you'll see that obviously the robot can't start with both feet on the ground. If it does, no matter what its mass distribution is on the decline plane, it's just going to fall, fall forward. So, in all of the experiments here, whenever they try out one of these simulated passive dynamic walkers, evolution is going to set the initial angle of one of the legs, which I think should actually be B sub X here. If you look at the coordinate system there, I think it's the rotation of one of the legs about the X axis. Doesn't really matter, but we've got these initial 12 parameters that evolution is going to play with. We have another set of morphological parameters that evolution is going to play with, which are springs. And we haven't seen springs yet, so let's just do a, a crash course on springs. If we want to simulate a spring or describe a physical spring, we need two numbers to describe it, the stiffness of the spring and the damping coefficient. The stiffness, as you would imagine, is how stiff, stiff is the spring. Low stiffness means it's made out of a very thin coil of metal. Uh, very high stiffness may, means it's a steel spring, very, very hard to compress or extend. The damping coefficient says when we push the spring inward from its resting length or pull it out away from its resting length, how is it going to behave as it returns to its resting length? And resting length, again, as the name implies, is sort of the, the default length of the spring when nothing is pulling or pushing on the spring. OK. Something that has high damping means that it is going to return as quickly as possible to the rest length. Low damping means the spring doesn't matter. It doesn't mind too much if it's pulled or pushed away from its resting mass. It'll bounce around for a while until eventually returning to its default length. By setting different values of stiffness and damping, you get different kinds of behavior from a spring. And uh, apologies for my lack of artistic ability here. Here is my attempt to scribble four different kinds of springs. Here we have a high stiffness, high damping spring. The horizontal axis here you can think of as time. And the vertical axis, y equals 0, represents the wet resting length of the spring, and positive y values mean someone has pulled the spring beyond its resting length, and a negative y value means someone has pushed it shorter than its resting length. So in this little cartoon example here, we're taking our high stiffness, high damping spring, and we haven't been able to expand it very far away from its resting length because it's stiff. When we let go because of high damping, it very quickly returns to y equals 0, its resting length. If we take the same high stiffness spring but now reduce damping, it's still stiff, 
but when we let go in this case, it bounces around for a very, very long time before eventually returning to its resting length. Make sense? The inverse case here, low stiffness and high damping, it's relatively easy to extend or compress the spring, but because of the high damping, when we let go, it immediately returns, or more or less returns quickly to its resting length. A low stiffness, no damping uh, spring is like a slinky. If you ever played with a slinky, that's a low stiffness, low damped spring, more or less. So far, so good. Question? Uh, can you have a negative damping value? Not really. So damping is a positive value, which describes the length of time it takes for it to return to its resting length. You can't have a negative span of time. It's usually a positive value. So you can think of both of these values as positive values. Yes? Are stiffness and damping like correlated with each other? They are not correlated, and that's what these two pictures are meant to represent, right? You can have high stiffness, low damping, or vice versa. They're different properties of the same physical object. Okay, we have a total of five springs, or sorry, we have a total of 10 springs, five per side. We have two springs at the hip, which are acting on the two rotational degrees of freedom. So up till now, everything you've seen in PyroSim is you have either a completely passive uh, joint that swings freely as the robot moves, uh, so in the earlier assignments, you remember your ragdoll robot where there were no motors and everything just swung passively. And then you would clamp a motor onto that joint and now the motor was controlling the motion of the joint. We're now complicating things a little bit by adding a spring. So imagine we have a passive joint. We attach a motor to it and motor sends a command that pulls that joint away from its resting length. So imagine the two objects that are attached by the joint are also attached, like in the picture here, with the joint. So the joint is going to resist the motion of the motor, at least when the motor tries to move the joint, uh, move, the, uh, move the spring away from its resting length. Imagine that the joint is rotated at some given angle that's actually already extended the spring and the motor starts to send a desired angle inward that actually shortens the spring, how much force does the motor need to apply to reach that desired angle? We have an extended spring, and the motor is applying a force that's going to rotate the object back in, and will actually start to shorten the spring back towards its resting length. No force or very little force, right? So the spring and the motor are kind of working together. They're both trying to pull the, uh, the joint inward and reduce the spring. Imagine the inverse case. We have the joint rotated to some angle. The spring is extended away from its resting length. And the motor is trying to push in the opposite direction. It's trying to rotate the joint so that the spring will become even longer. How much force does the motor need to apply in this case? relatively speaking. A lot. A, lo a lot more, right? So in this robot here, in the back of your mind, remember that we've got joints, motors, and springs. Sometimes the motors are working with the spring, and sometimes they're working against the spring. In this phase one, where we have no motors, we have a purely passive dynamic walker. It's just a mechanism with, with springs on it. All right, we have two springs at the hip, one that's, that's influencing each of the two joints at the hip. We have a third spring at the knee, which you don't see in this uh, picture, and then we have a fourth and fifth spring in the uh, ankle, which is again controlling or influencing the two joints at the ankle, right? You don't have springs inside you, but you have things that act like this. And tendons and ligaments and all the rest of it, right? Sometimes those are working in synergy with what your muscles are trying to do, and sometimes they're working uh, against it. As you're walking during bipedal locomotion, uh, when your stance foot, the one that's carrying your weight, uh, is behind you and you're about to land with your other foot in front of you, you can usually feel your Achilles tendon drip down the back uh, of your leg being stretched, right? That is, in essence, that the Achilles tendon is, in essence, a spring that is being lengthened 
so that at the moment your toe leaves the ground at the back, that tendon is trying to shorten and gives you a little bit of a push forward without using your muscles. So your muscles are in essence loading the spring based on your mass distribution and your momentum and what your muscles are doing. They're causing those tendons to stretch and they're storing energy temporarily in that tendon which wants to shorten again. And the moment at which it's able to shorten is when the weight on your back foot starts to lessen. As that force starts to lessen, the tendon is able to actually shorten and gives you a little bit of a, a push forward. Not unlike the hybrid dynamic walker that we just saw, where it's passive most of the time, and there is a motor that gives a little bit of a push right when the stance foot is becoming the swing foot. All good so far? Okay, so down one side of the passive dynamic walker, we have five springs. For each of those five springs, evolution is going to set the stiffness and dampness, uh, the damping values of those springs. Same on the other side. We have another five springs on the other side. For each of those five springs, there's a pair of values, the stiffness and dampness, uh, damping value. And as you can imagine, in this experiment, the values running down the right side of the body are going to be exactly the same as the values on the left side of the uh, body. So the investigators here are going to impose bilateral symmetry. We don't want to have a robot where springs have different uh, stiffness and damping coefficients on one side compared to the other. It doesn't really make sense. Right? So evolution is going to play with these values. I've, I've explained all these values to you. How many values are there? I've just walked you through the phenotype of the robot. What's the genotype? We have a data structure that's encoding a set of these morphological parameters. How many of these parameters are there? We've got 12 here plus We've got a vector with how many numbers in it to describe how many? Plenty. Close, not quite. 70. <laughs> We've got 12 here, right, I think. Plus an additional 10 here, 5 times 2. We've got 22 values. So with 22 values, we can set all of the morphological parameters to describe one robot. Take that robot, put it at the top of a simulated decline plane. What's the fitness function? How far it travels. How far it travels. All right. So we have a whole bunch. We have a population of 22 length vectors. We take each one, tag the robot, put it at the top of the plane, measure how far it, it travels down the decline plane. You've now done a little bit of evolutionary algorithms yourselves. You should be able to simulate this in your head. What happens? You're maximizing displacement. What are you going to get? Are you going to get passive dynamic walking? I feel like it's going to fall. <clears throat> Most of them are going to fall. 99.99% of them are going to fall, which will get you some displacement. Right? But you can do better than that, or evolution can do better than that. What does evolution do? If you were to just select, if your fitness function was just displacement, what are you going to get? So I wouldn't, like, focus on the walking gait, it would maybe like try to run something? I mean, Possibly. Do you think you're going to get running gaits? Yeah. Rolling. Rolling, maybe. Jumping. Jumping. You probably get everything other than passive dynamic walking. Uh, you can try this out yourself. Most of the time what you'll get are robots that fall over and then kick the ground and go head first down the declined plane, right? All we asked for was displacement. We didn't say anything about stability. Evolving bipedal locomotion is one of the most difficult things you can do. This is one of the few experiments where there's been uh, some success. Very, very tricky to do. Have, or has there ever been someone who's tried like putting like, uh, like sensors on the robot that would 
like say do not drag anything like, I don't know. Possibly, so we could start to put some sensors on here and, and ask it not to drag its feet, and it could probably find a way to fall down and make sure that its feet don't drag on the floor. What if you had a sensor on like, the top of the mask to adjust things, and hold it not to touch the ground or get close to the top? Absolutely. So in Pyrosyn, there's the position sensor. We could put a position sensor there and say your Y value or your your vertical height should not go below some threshold. There have been several attempts to do that. Um, that's not what they did in this experiment. I'll show you what they did in a moment. Before we look at the fitness function, let's look at the neural network, which is odd because we're going to start without a neural network. So let's talk about this neural network, and we're going to talk about how they gradually bring in the neural network. This is arranged more or less like you've seen before. We've got the sensor layer on this side, the hidden layer in here, a couple of additional hidden neurons here, and then the output layer here. Let's start with the output layer, which is a little bit easier to digest. We've got five output neurons here, which are going to send motor commands to the five joints running down one side of the body. This neural network only controls one side of the body, and we'll talk about the other side in a moment. You'll notice that each of these five output neurons uh, has a postfix, which is VEL, standing for velocity. Most of what we've seen uh, so far has been what's known as position control, meaning that the values that arrive at the output layer are treated as desired positions, or in our case, desired angles. You can also have velocity control, where you take the values that are arriving at the output layer, and instead of treating them as uh, ang degrees or radians, you instead treat them as desired radians per second. So the five values that are arriving at the output layer are sending commands to the five motors, saying, motor I, I would like you to rotate at these many radians per second. At every time step of the simulation, the values arriving at the output layer are changing, so there are different desired velocities at the joints. For our purposes up till now, it doesn't really matter whether we're doing position or velocity control, just so you know the distinction. Okay, we got a whole bunch uh, of sensors here, and there's a little legend at the bottom uh, right there to help you uh, figure this out. They're gonna put angle sensors otherwise known as proprioceptive sensors at the 10 joints, five on one side, five at the other. Uh, we have force sensors, which we haven't seen before. The force sensor is measuring the amount of force that the motor is applying to try, to try and reach its desired velocity. And of course, we have springs in the mix as well. So sometimes those motors are gonna be working really hard, and sometimes those motors may not be working at all. If, an, if a motor outputs three radians per second and the joint is currently rotating at three radians per second, the motor says, I don't need to do anything. The joint is already doing what I want it to do. I'm going to apply no force to the joint. And then in this case, the for, that force sensor would register a value of zero. Okay. We also have some rotation sensors here, which measure rotation about x, y, or z axis, and finally some acceleration sensors as well, which are measuring the acceleration of the robot about x, y, and z here. So we've got a mixture of different kinds of sensors which are flowing, their values are flowing into a hidden layer and eventually out to an output layer, not unlike what we've seen before. There's one additional type of neuron here, which we haven't seen before. This is a CPG neuron, or a central pattern generator. This neuron here is not too different from the bias neuron that we saw last time. A bias neuron outputs a constant value, and then as evolution tunes the outgoing synaptic weights from that bias neuron, it can influence constant values flowing into the target neurons. A CPG neuron, instead of outputting a constant value, outputs a constant sinusoidal pattern at some fixed frequency. You can imagine that sinusoidal pattern flowing outward from the CPG into the hidden neurons, where that sinusoidal pattern is being mixed 
with the incoming sensory uh, signals and flowing out to the motors. If the sensors are all turned off, which they're going to be for the passive dynamic walker, then we have this sinusoidal pattern, which is flowing down to the five neurons, uh, the five motor neurons, and you're going to get oscillations in movement of the joints without a lot of intelligence. It's just this one CPG. Uh, most higher animals, we have central pattern generators that are embedded in our spine. Um, if you've ever uh, heard or seen a chicken with its head cut off and it keeps running, it's running because the CPGs in the chicken are in its spine and those CPGs can control the movement of the legs uh, of the chicken and allow it to run around for a while until it hits something and falls over because clearly there is no sensory compensation for the movement that comes from the brain which is no longer connected to the body. So the central pattern generator does most of the work in legged locomotion and our brains are very are calibrating or um, modulating that motion depending on what else is going on. In the summer, most of the time on flat ground, you can sort of walk around without thinking about it. If you climbed over some icy hills this morning, your CPG was doing a little bit of the work and your brain was doing a lot of the work, deciding where to place your feet and so on. So bipedal locomotion is always a balancing act between the CPG and the central nervous system. In this case here, here's the CPG pathway and here is the central nervous system or the sensory influence on motion. So far so good? Okay. Yes, question. Uh, I have a question about the hidden layer. Sure. Is this an evolved uh, network or is it the one you initially put in the evolved robot? This is the one that is going to be put into the robot and in later phases, not phase one, we're going to start to evolve the synaptic weights. Okay. Is, yeah. there, is there like a general rule for determining how many hidden neurons you put in? There is not. That is a good question which comes up eventually in any discussion about machine learning. No one knows how to determine the, arc, the, the best architecture for a neural network, which is how many hidden neurons, how many layers, what synapses should be connected to which other neurons. That is an open problem in AI at the moment. Uh, do we do anything to get to the fact that any mutation to the CPG might have a bigger impact uh, on the overall behavior than any other cell? It's not, or at least it seems like it's more equivalent. That's a very good question. If you imagine uh, mu evolution mutating any of the synapses between the CPGs and the motors, intuitively that would probably have a bigger impact on motion than a mutation between any one sensor neuron and the hidden layer. Maybe. There is a lot of work in the literature on ensuring that mutations have a small impact on behavior. And we'll actually talk about that uh, in the next lecture when we talk about modularity, trying to localize the impact of mutations on behavior. Here you may be right, any one mutation may have a relatively big impact. We can't really know from this experiment. Any other questions before we move on? Scott. So this is for one leg only. Is there one CPG for both legs or do they have their own separate one? Okay, good question. There is one CPG neuron for the entire robot and it's going to act like uh, it's going to act again like a, a conductor in an orchestra. The CPG is actually not in this case is not going to output a, a, a continuous sinusoidal pattern. It's going to send out a pulse, a value, and then the CPG is going to go quiet. It's going to go to zero for a while, send out another pulse, go back to zero. So we're going to get spikes of uh, activity in the CPG and then it's going to be quiet for a constant length of time. So instead of what CPGs normally do in higher animals, which is produce a regular oscillation, they're going to, our CPG here is going to produce a spike, zero, spike, zero, spike, zero, and so on. Okay. The CPG is going to send a spike to the left leg. It's going to send a pulse of activation through this neural network, which is attached to the left leg. And it's going to send zero to the other leg. And it's going to go quiet. Then it's going to send a pulse to the right leg. 
And the right leg has an exact copy of the left leg neural network. So inside this robot, there are two identical copies of this neural network. But they're activated left, right, left, right, left, right, and so on. So far, so good. One CPG, two subnetwork, two identical subnetworks, but they're activated in antiphase to one another. When one is activated, the other one's quiet, and vice versa. Okay, let's talk about the fitness function. Uh, as you can see, it's a relatively complex uh, fitness function. Let's start with f equals d. My guess is that the investigators initially did this experiment with just f equals d, and they saw all the silly walks and more <coughs> that we just, just talked about, right? So they went back and started to add or multiply terms together. The way to read this fitness function is we want d, and we do not want you, the robot, to do t, x, z, r, or y. Right? Sometimes we see penalty terms where the value inside the penalty term is subtracted. Um, another way to do it is 1 over 1 plus the penalty term, as long as the penalty term is always a positive value. Right? Mm -hmm. If uh, the penalty term is positive, then we're trying to basically push that value down towards 0 and get rid of it. Right? The closer t or x or z or r or y is to 0, the more its associated term approaches 1. The greater any of those values become, the closer to 0 those terms become. And because we're multiplying them together, it doesn't matter what any of the other terms are. If any of those terms approach 0, the fitness of the whole robot is 0. So this is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty strict fitness function. Right? It's almost like an AND. You've got to try and keep all of t and x and z and r and y close to 0. And if you do, then you get to obtain d. If you don't, no matter how big d is, you get nothing. Right? And the reason why, as you can imagine, is most of the time there's lots of behaviors that maximize d. The robot falls forward and dives forward head first and gets quite a distance down the decline plane, but it is definitely not passive dynamic walking. For the grad students that are already working on your final project, you're gonna come up against this pretty quickly. Whatever kind of behavior you're looking for in your robot, you're probably gonna to have to start to formulate additional penalty terms. I want D, but I do not want this particular form of a silly walk, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. Okay, what are these uh, penalty terms? Well, let's start with T. T is the total amount of torque or rotational force that the joints, uh, that the motors apply. So I mentioned torque in, in passing before for the non-engineers here. We can apply a linear force, we can push against something, but in PyroSim and in this simulation, what the motors are really doing is applying torque, which is a rotational force. We're trying to rotate one object relative to another one. So wherever you see torque, just remember this is a form of force. Okay, why minimize T? Asimo, we want to avoid asimo, right? We, we're going to add motors, at least in phase two and beyond, but we want those motors, we want to use them as sparingly as possible, right? Whenever the motor, whenever the desired velocity and the actual velocity of a joint is, zero, is equal, the difference is zero, then the motor is silent and T is zero for that motor at that point in time. We'd like that to be true as often as possible among all 10 motors. What about x? So we're back to the Ministry of Silly Walks. We want to, we want to minimize hip rotation about the x-axis. We don't want something walking down the decline plane where the upper body is rotating far forward and far backward. We would like it to keep the upper body over the legs as much as possible. Hip rotation about the z-axis. We don't want a robot that is rotating a lot about its long axis. And then hip rotation about the y-axis. We don't want something walking down the decline plane like this. For hip rotation about the x-axis, would that depend on the incline of 
the environment? Possibly, and I think we talked about this last time. So if the decline is pretty steep, we still don't want a robot that's facing too far forward, a little bit. We would prefer that it tries to keep it's, it tries to keep its, its body upright, regardless of the angle of the plane over which it's walking. So that would, that would be a non-zero value for the hip it, it would be. So some of these things are fighting against one another, right? We, we clearly can't get exactly zero for all of these, which would be a robot that just doesn't move at all, right? So there's a little bit of play between these, <laughs> these terms, for sure. Okay. Okay, so let's now finally uh, walk through this evolutionary algorithm. We're gonna use scaffolding, and there aren't actually two phases, there's gonna be three phases. And in each of these three phases, I'm gonna, we're gonna think about what happens during evolution, and then what happens during evaluation. What, and evaluation is simply the evaluation of one single robot. So during evolution in this first uh, phase, we're actually going to allow part of the neural network to act. So this isn't 100% passive dynamic walking. We're gonna evolve the synaptic weights between the CPG neuron and the motor neuron. So I'll just back up for a moment. We're gonna evolve all of these synaptic weights in here. And all of these synaptic weights are gonna be set to zero. The sensors aren't really even, even there. So we're going to evolve the CPG to hidden and hidden to motor synapses. So we're going to evolve that part of the brain and also the 22 body parameters that we just saw a few minutes back. Yeah. Okay. During evaluation, we're going to take the robot, put it at the top of the declined uh, plane, rotate B sub X, not B sub Y, to its angle, turn on the simulation, and we're gonna supply one CPG pulse to one leg. Doesn't really specify which one, doesn't really matter. So the robot is gonna sort of twitch right at the beginning during T0, and the moment it does, shut off the neural network. Everything else is purely passive dynamic locomotion going down the declined plane, and the fitness of any one robot is this. So far, so good. Unfortunately, these investigators did not post any videos. This was the pre-YouTube era. It would be great to see, to see this in action. For those of you still thinking about a final uh, project idea, here's one for you. Okay. If you go back and look at the actual fitness curves in this, uh, in this paper, as you can imagine, they actually did successfully evolve passive dynamic walking down the decline plane. So they evolve for a while until they finally get <laughs> passive dynamic walking. When they do, they pause the evolutionary run and alter things a little bit. Now they're going to, uh, and now, now when they unpause evolution, they're going to continue to allow evolution to evolve the CPG to motor parameters. They're also going to continue, evolution is going to continue evolving the 22 body parameters. But we're going to alter the fitness function a little bit to gradually wean the robot off the declined plane and enable hybrid dynamic walking. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we're going to evaluate the robot twice on the decline plane and on flat ground. So we're going to evaluate every controller twice. And as we do, we're going to get a time series plot of the velocity of, doesn't really matter, I think it's the hip of the robot. If you remember back to the assignments when you were drawing the time series data of your sensor values, same thing here. We're plotting the velocity over time, which gives us, which gives us a velocity profile of how the robot moves over time. What's its velocity as it moves down the declined plane? We then take the same robot, put it on, the, on flat ground, and it's going to now move using hybrid dynamic walking, which we'll talk about in a moment. And as it does, it might start doing what the passive dynamic walker did, but then maybe it falls over and stops moving. So we can then sum the difference over the evaluation period between the velocity profile of the passive dynamic walker in, in the passive uh, form and in the hybrid form. And we're going to add 1 over 1 plus v. Which does what? 
finishes for the different error between the um, incline plane and the flat? Exactly, right? So we're trying to get these two velocity profiles to line up. So there is zero difference. There is zero V. In essence, we're telling evolution, find a robot that when it moves in the hybrid form, it does so as similarly to its passive form as possible, right? You train uh, a young person to ride a bicycle using training wheels, and you would hope when you remove the training wheels that they're using what they learned with the training wheels to move in the same way, right? We don't want the learner to rely on the training wheels so that when we remove them, they do something completely different, like, for example, falling over, right? So we're actively trying to wean the robot off the scaffold, which is the declined plane, by adding this additional penalty term. Make sense? OK. OK. During evaluation, how do we get hybrid dynamic walking? We're going to start by doing the same thing we did before. We're going to take the robot and put it on flat ground. During the second eva first evaluation, same thing as before. Put it on the decline plane, one single pulse of the CPG, and then the CPG is turned off. That's not going to work on flat ground. We need the robot to be able to keep walking. So we're going to put it on flat ground. Again, the CPG is going to pulse, and the robot is going to start falling. And as it falls, it may fall forward, it may fall backward, but eventually the other foot will in come into contact with the ground. And the moment that other foot comes into contact with the ground, we send a spike of activation to the other leg. So in essence, the body of the robot is setting the frequency of the central pattern generator. If we have a robot with long legs and it takes a long time for the heel to strike the ground, then we're going to have a very low frequency CPG. It will continue to beat at whatever that frequency is. If we have a robot with short legs and it very quickly comes into contact with the ground, we're going to have a high frequency CPG. So we're indirectly setting the frequency of the CPG based on the movement and the body of the robot. So in the second evaluation period, the CPG <coughs> is going to act like this, send a pulse to the left leg, then the right leg, left leg, right leg at this constant frequency. And assuming that evolution does its job, it should be able to keep the robot upright and continue moving. Right? Uh, I forgot to mention when we were talking about the fitness function, there's nothing in here that explicitly selects for falling over. Or is there? When, when they actually evolve these robots, they don't fall over. There's no explicit fall over term. Or is there? Possibly. Like maybe the foot angle would take care of it? Maybe. Not quite. Torque once you're on the ground, there's no swing. Uh, maybe. You could lie down, and in the hybrid case, you can kick the ground with your heels. That'll, that'll run the CPG out. Yeah, so it would run the torque up. It would run the torque up. That's true. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. That, that might help indirectly. Yeah. You'll notice that we're penalizing for rotation about the x, y, and z plane, right? So obviously, if you're falling forward, then uh, x is going up, and that's bad. If you fall to your left, uh, you're rotating about the y axis, and that's bad. y will start to run up. And as if you twist as you're falling over, z will go up. So it's impossible to fall over and keep x, y, and z here near zero values. So it is actually kind of selecting for the robot to fall over. It could, in theory, crumple down on itself. There's nothing here that penalizes height. But given the springs, there is no way for the robot to crouch down without rotating about any of these three axes. All right, just a little bit of a detail, but worthwhile to think about. OK, so let's look at what this actually looks like in the hybrid case. So in phase three, uh, sorry, phase two here, we'll talk about phase three in a moment. In phase two here, the blue is, as you can imagine, the uh, CPG. So for this particular robot, the heel struck about uh, 30 time steps uh, after the robot was, was allowed to move. 
as the robot was falling down, uh, sorry, was moving along the flat ground, you can see the angle of one of the hip motors and one of the angles of the knee joints. Can you visualize this in your head? A little hard to do. You'll notice if you pay attention to the yellow, that's the uh, flexing of the knee, and then the knee actually straightens out. The knee actually straightens out for the last 10 time steps or so before the CPG fires again. Why? So I brought that one away just to bring it Absolutely, right? Again, you can try this uh, later today. Don't try it out on the ice, but if you come down onto your stance foot with your knee not locked, you can brace yourself as long as you tense your muscles, but it's much easier to have your knee locked in which you can relax your muscles a little bit and get a little bit more uh, energy efficiency. Okay, so again, not as good as a video, but you sort of start to get the idea that this passive dynamic walker and this hybrid dynamic walker in this case is moving more or less like we do. Okay, what happens in phase three? Now they have hybrid dynamic walking. They have a robot that can walk over flat ground, and a lot of the time it's not using uh, the motors. T is pretty close to zero. But if there's any perturbation in the simulation, the robot is going to fall over because like our poor chick chicken with its head cut off, it has no sensors. It can't sense the perturbation and recover from that perturbation. So in phase three, we are going to gradually allow evolution to fold in sensory uh, compensation for perturbation. How do we do that? We reconnect the sensors to the neural network with small connection weights. And what does that mean? It means all of these synapses here in phase one and two, they all had a value of zero. In phase three, we're gonna allow mutations to start to hit these synapses and gradually move these values away from zero. This is another nice uh, trick of the trade, which might be useful for some of your final projects. We don't have to start synaptic weights with high magnitude random values, which means you tend to get crazy sort of exaggerated motion. You can start with zero and allow evolution to gradually add in things like sensors through mutation. Okay, so now we have in phase three, we have uh, the values arriving at the motors becoming some admixture of the CPG and the sensor values. Uh, we're gonna continue to evolve all the, all the uh, synaptic weights of the neural network now, the body parameters, and we're continuing to use one over one plus V. We're still evaluating each controller twice, once on the declined plane with only one CPG pulse, and a second time on flat ground with constant pulse. So far so good? Okay, what do we get at the end of phase three, at the end of stage three? We get things that look uh, more or less like this. They're going to, uh, this is one of these experiments that just keeps on giving. They're gonna continue on to phase four now. They're gonna evolve for another 100 generations. And during this phase of evolution, they're gonna introduce wind. Now, as the robot is moving on flat ground at least, there are small external uh, values that are being, uh, small external forces that are being applied to the robot's body. Uh, you can do this in PyroSim as well. I think there's add external force. You can simulate wind or perturbations. Fitness function is the same as before. Just keep walking despite the perturbations that hit you. Um, in the paper, they say uh, when the robot was pushed, when, when some of these evolved robots at the end of phase four were pushed for, uh, too far to the side, the machine was observed to adjust its foot placement by stepping inward to regain balance. Where have you seen that before? Uh, big dog, small dog came came later, right? Okay, so this was some work long before uh, big dog. So again, this was a, a big challenge in the field is not only getting a machine to walk, which can be energy efficient, but you're usually taking a hit in terms of stability, right? We all fall over from time to time. How do we take something that's out at this far end of the balance between uh, speed, energy efficiency, and robustness, and gradually uh, make it slightly more stable. 
Here's one way to do that, right? Okay, here's a visualization of how this works. This is them playing back one evolved robot from the end of phase uh, four. In this case, that particular robot took 37 steps before falling over. They played back that robot many more times, every time increasing the, wi the wind speed until eventually this robot is walking in the middle of a, a hurricane. Doesn't do very well, not surprisingly. But you can see that its drop off in performance is relatively graceful. Even in the presence of perturbations, it's able to alter its gait to recover its stability. Is this static stability or dynamic stability? This is dynamic stability. So this robot like a uh, big dog, like us, we have a certain gait, a comfortable way of walking, and if we ever are pushed outside of that by wind or ice or pebbles or something else in our environment, we adapt, we, re we recover and continue on. We're dynamically stable. In this case, not just because of our body, but also because, or for the robot, not just because of its body, but also because of its neural controller. It's sensing the perturbation and returning to stability. Okay, they continued on to phase five. Now, the perturbations were not external, they were internal. When they evaluated, when they were evolving robots in phase five, they took the 22 numbers that described the robot and they introduced a small amount of noise to those 22 numbers. So the robot was not built perfectly, it wasn't built to spec. There were slight errors in the way the robot was quote unquote manufactured. Everything else stayed the same, the fitness function and so on. So they are now trying to evolve these robots so that the same robot, if it was built twice, in one case it was built with slightly shorter legs or slightly longer legs, these two versions of the same robot would still successfully walk. This plot in the upper left is showing you, again, they're playing back the best evolved robot from the end of phase five now. They manufacture this robot many times, introducing more and more mistakes as they go. And again, we see a gradual degradation in performance. So this robot is a little bit, is, is pretty robust to manufacturing error. Why would they bother doing this? You're working in a simulation, you can build everything perfectly. If you work across the reality gap, any time you manufacture something, Absolutely. One of the biggest challenges in the field at the moment, which we'll talk about uh, in a couple weeks' time, is the reality gap problem. If we go to build this robot in reality, clearly the physical version is going to be different from the simulated version. So before we cross the reality gap, maybe we can robustify the robot a little bit that might help it cross the gap if we were to realize this robot in reality. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that in a couple weeks' time. Okay, there's no phase six, they ended at this point. They, took, they wanted to see, however, what they had. They'd done a lot of evolution through these five stages of evolution. What exactly was this robot robust to? In this case, again, they took the best evolved robot from the end of phase five, and they played it back, and in this case, they tinkered with the CPG. So if you look carefully at these purple pulses, and if you look at the width between pairs of pulses, you'll see that around here, they increase the frequency of the CPG a little bit. The spikes are a little bit closer together horizontally. And when they do, the robot starts to take shorter steps. They then slow the frequency of the CPG, so it's beating now at a slower frequency, and the robot takes longer steps. Why? It's adapting to how the subnatural cycles, like the other, the sensor neurons are compensating for the CPG. Exactly. So there is no CPG sensor directly, but the CPG is influencing the motors, which is influencing the movement of the robot, and the robot has 
velocity and acceleration sensors and so on. So the robot can indirectly sense the change in its motion, which in this case is not being caused by wind or manufacturing errors. It's being caused by errors in its internal timing mechanism. It's never been evolved to deal with this situation. Throughout all five phases of evolution, the CPG never the frequency of the CPG never changed during the lifetime of the robot. But the fact that it evolved to be robust to wind and manufacturing errors gave you for free, more or less, robustness to this other form of noise. And this is exciting from a robotics point of view because we can never prepare our robot for all the different kinds of variation it's going to see when we release these machines into the world. But maybe if we make them robust to various aspects in simulation, there will be novel forms of variety they see in reality that they never saw before. They may be able to deal with those because it's close enough to other kinds of uh, perturbations we imposed during simulation. Okay, that concludes our discussion of passive dynamic walking, bipedal locomotion, legged locomotion, all good? Okay, we've got 15 minutes left, so let's just start in on open challenges in the field of evolutionary uh, robotics. We're going to talk uh, today and uh, next time about modularity, and this was mentioned earlier, is that one of the things we want to guard against is a mutation having a huge impact on behavior, right? That doesn't seem like a good thing. Can we sort of localize the behavioral impact of mutation? There's one way we can do that, which is with modularity. This is something that we try to introduce into all our engineering systems, so that if there's ever a problem in any one module, it doesn't necessarily propagate to all the other parts uh, of the system. Inversely, we can also swap out a module and replace it with a better module and hopefully not influence too much the operation of the other modules. Turns out that if you allow evolution to tinker not just with the synaptic weights of a neural network, but also the architecture, evolu an evolutionary algorithm will create increasingly non-modular neural networks. It will add more and more neurons and wire up those neurons to every other neuron and you end up with a huge non-modular mass, which means that later on in evolution it grinds to a halt because now in that big tangled mess, any mutation to any one synapse propagates to all the neurons, which greatly influences the behavior of the robot, usually for the worse. If you look at all nervous systems in all higher animals, it is not like that. Our nervous system is quite modular. So there is an open problem in the evolution of modularity. How do we actually influence our robots to evolve modular brains or maybe even modular bodies? Mother Nature seems to do it. It's not quite clear how or why she does that. What kinds of selection pressures acted on our ancestors to produce, to produce modular nervous systems? It's an open problem in the field. Okay, so that's a little bit, bit of background. Let's dive into exactly what this means. As I just mentioned, modularity is an important cro uh, concept, not just in robotics, in anything really we, we engineer, especially in, uh, especially in computer science. Uh, hopefully some of you have been exposed to object-oriented programming, where an object is more or less a synonym for a module. And again, we already talked about the benefits uh, of that. We've already done a little bit of uh, code modularization in the refactoring uh, assignment. You can imagine defining a generic class in PyroSim called shape. Every shape or every object you send to PyroSim, you want to create it, you want to delete it, you want to draw it. So we've got this common uh, interface. And we want to hide the internal complexities of that module from the other parts of your code that manipulate these shapes. You can imagine a higher order uh, module like robot. robot. Robots are also created and drawn and deleted. And then we're going to hide all of the internal complexity of this robot module from, for example, the evolutionary algorithm, which is acting on the robots and so on. Right? So modularity is everywhere. 
Usually we're creating that by hand in code like this. As we're going to see in a moment, in this case, we're not, in this experiment, we are not going to be creating the modularity by hand. We're going to see whether we can get evolution to create the modularity for us. Okay. So why is it important in evolutionary robotics? Well, we'd like to have this idea of structural modularity. Structural modularity means we should be able to look at the neural network and tell from the structure, the connectivity of synapses, that that network is or isn't modular. If we have a neural network in which all n neurons are attached to all other n neurons, including itself, the number of synapses grows quadratically with the number of neurons. Right? Uh, you have 10 to the 11 neurons, more or less, in your nervous system. If all of those 10 to 11 uh, neurons were attached to every other 10 to the 11 neurons uh, with uh, uh, synapses, your skull would need to encompass a nervous system about the size of the moon. So not very practical. There are clearly anatomical reasons why Mother Nature has created modular nervous systems in higher animals, but there are also good functional reasons for doing so. We've already seen functional modularity, which means you might look at a neural network and it may not look structurally modular. You may not see a bunch of densely connected subnetworks with one or no synapses between them but the network acts in a functional manner. And we saw this when we looked at the small humanoid robot that was shaking the block up and down and left and right and forward and back. It had this structurally non-modular network, but the fast and slow neurons worked together to push that network into a few discrete patterns. You could point at any one of those patterns, which were the motor primitives of the robot and say that's a module. That's functional modularity. Today we're going to focus on in this lecture on structural modularity, actually creating or getting evolution to create distinct subnetworks. As always in biology it's all of the above. Uh, biological nervous systems in higher animals are typically both structurally modular and functionally modular. Okay. We'll skip over that. Okay, so um, given a task uh, as a roboticist, we could, of course, sit down and knowing that modularity is a good thing, we could try and break that task into subtasks and create different subnetworks inside the robot for each of those subtasks. Or we could take one step back away from the design process and say, evolution, we would like you to find the modules we would like you to partition the task into appropriate subtasks for you and figure out the synaptic weights and design those subnetworks and so on. Obviously, the latter is going to be a little bit trickier but has obvious advantages because thinking about thinking is misleading. Imagine we have our little small wheeled robot here that's driving around, and we would like it to, for example, approach cylindrical objects and move away from cubes. And we can see at this instant in time, that or at this instant of time, the robot is driving past a cylinder. And at some other point in time, the robot is driving past uh, a, a block. And under those two conditions, we would like the robot to do different things. And in this hypothetical example, we may become frustrated because the robot never does different things under these two conditions. Why not? The resolution of the sensor is high enough. The resolution of the sensors isn't high enough. From the robot's point of view, the robot says, what do you mean by cylinders and cubes? There aren't. These two objects are exactly the same thing. I can't distinguish between them, so I can't do different things under these two different conditions. From the robot's point of view, this object looks like this. And from the robot's point of view, this other object looks like this. Right? So as we move on through the course, we're going to talk about distal and proximal perspectives of behavior. Proximal means close. So from if we put ourselves in the robot's shoes, we're seeing things closely from the robot's point of view. <laughs> things often look very different 
from our view, the distal view. We are distant from the robot. We are observing the robot and its environment. What we see or sense about this particular scene may be very different from what the robot senses or sees about its scene. Aren't the robot sensors going to see different things at the next time step? Absolutely. And then it's going to do different of course, I, I cooked this example, right? The moment the robot moves, that all goes out the window. This is just meant to be sort of a, just a visual reminder that there are situations where distal and proximal perspectives don't line up. We have a task we want the robot to do. In our mind's eye, we decide how to partition that task into do two different subtasks. But from the point of view of the robot, it's very difficult or impossible for it to tell when it's in these two different conditions that it should do task one or task two. We may, if we, want to tr if we decide to, to do the modularity for the robot, we may break the task into the wrong subtasks. We may impose the wrong kind of modularity on the robot because we have a very different view on what the robot can see and do. All right, okay. So yet another reminder that thinking about thinking is misleading. So we would like to avoid that trap by taking a step backwards and letting evolution figure out whether and how modularity is appropriate to a given task. Okay. In this experiment here, uh, this was actually done quite a while back. Um, this was work done with the Kepra robot that we've seen uh, before. Uh, we're, gonna have a, uh, we're gonna have a simulated phase and a physical phase. Uh, in both cases, the Kepra drives around and there are these small uh, wooden cylindrical blocks. It's in, in its environment, not the sugar cube you see here. Uh, the Kepra should drive around inside this arena, find these five wooden blocks, when it finds one, pick it up, drive it to the edge of the arena, and drop the block outside the arena. That's the task. Okay. The robot has se uh, seven sensors, six infrared sensors, uh, six beams in front of it. So again, it can sort of see about 45 degrees in front of it. And the seventh sensor is a light barrier sensor inside the gripper. So when it's holding something, that light barrier is broken. So the robot knows it's holding something. If there's nothing between its left pincer and its right pincer, the light beam is unbroken and it's not holding something. So the robot can see in front of itself and feel, quote unquote, feel whether it's holding something. The motors, uh, one of them controls the left wheel, the other one controls the right wheel. The third motor sort of triggers uh, a motor primitive, which is pick up an object. And the fourth motor, when it fires, induces another motor primitive, which is drop the object. So it's not quite a one-to-one -one match between a motor and a, a, a rotational joint in this case, but you get the idea. These four motors can spin the left or right wheel, pick up, or release. Okay. So before we evolve modularity here, let's for the sake of argument, try and actually partition this task down. It seems obvious from our point of view, or at least it does to me, how you should partition this task. We want the robot to get rid of all of the objects. So the first thing it should do is move. Robots that don't move are gonna have a hard time cleaning the environment. So maybe we create submodule A, which is basically a Breitenberg vehicle. Turn towards broken uh, infrared sensors on your right, because there's something over there. Uh, if you have shortened infrared sensors on your left, turn to the left, right? So that's the coward or the, the bully, whichever it is. Anyways, simple Breitenberg vehicle, that makes sense. So use neural network A to get to an object. Once you get to the object, recognize it. Are you in front of a wall or, uh, or, or a cylinder? If it's a cylinder, pick up. Once you're holding something, uh, maybe you have motor neuro, uh, you have subnetwork D here, a fourth neural network that now drives to, to a wall, to the closest wall. And then the final one here, the final one or two subnetworks recognize the wall, move to it, and then drop. So in this partition, we have one, two, three, four, five, six subtasks. You can imagine creating a fitness function that selects for uh, the weights for each of these subnetworks, 
and we stack them all together so that any one of these subnetworks is in control of the motors when that subnetwork is triggered, when that situation is appropriate for that subnetwork. Make sense? Seems obvious. Probably should just go ahead and do that, right? What could possibly go wrong? Okay, you know where this is going. Uh, next Tuesday, we will see why this particular thinking about thinking is misleading. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're working on assignment seven. Grads, final project. See you next week. <laughs>